Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Battle of the Pyramids, Napoleon in Egypt Part 2 by Extra History. So I had a great time with the first part of this series. I think Napoleon's Egyptian campaign is a really underappreciated part of his biography, and I'm glad we're getting a chance to look at it. Now, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this episode. Nile River, July 7th, 1798. The mood of the officers has turned. They've been in the desert for a week. Their men are exhausted, and mm. some think Napoleon has finally gone too far. And this is what I meant last week when I said that the French wouldn't necessarily struggle with the Mamelukes, but that other factors would give them a lot of trouble. Now, one of those factors will be the British. Another one of those factors will be the fact that they have to march through the Egyptian desert undersupplied and dehydrated. This is certainly not a fun thing to do for anybody, but... At this level of dehydration, you begin to get a little mutinous, maybe. General Miro is the most blunt. Napoleon has mismanaged this expedition, he says. The troops are going mad and dying of thirst. This operation was hasty and poorly planned. The British fleet could trap them here at any minute. They should mm -hmm. withdraw, secure the Mediterranean, then return under better conditions. Others nod. Mirar's words carry weight. At 28, he's young, the same age as Napoleon, but he's also a hero of the revolution. The first man to lead troops in singing the revolutionary anthem, La Marseillaise. <laughs> Yet Napoleon coldly shuts him down. They will continue to Cairo. General Murat, however, takes a different route. Now, these are fair complaints, absolutely. The campaign is not going as well as many of these officers would have imagined. I mean, there's two aspects to that. One is that... They are genuinely underperforming. Napoleon has not prepared as well as he should have. But number two is that they had these grand ambitions, the grand visions of what they would do once they arrived that were so unrealistic that they couldn't possibly have been met. And so a lot of the officer corps is pretty unhappy. Now, that's understandable, but when your officer corps is unhappy, they get together and chat becomes a bit of an echo chamber, and they increasingly get more and more unhappy. As the commanding general, you could begin to have a real problem on your hands. Especially if some of these guys are ambitious. Who knows what they're going to do? Are they going to challenge your authority? Now, you are Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, hero of the Italian campaign. You are beloved back in France, but you're not untouchable. Who knows what could happen out here in Egypt? These are some of the thoughts that might be going through Napoleon's mind. The morning after the showdown, Murat, knowing his career is over and the expedition doomed, rides into the desert and shoots himself. Damn. Yet another soldier lost to Napoleon's ambition. And sort of another aspect of this is, you know, a lot of these officers feel like this is underplanned. You know, Napoleon is just not ready for this. Also, why are we doing this? <laughs> you know, when people get into a desperate situation, like I said, marching through the desert, undersupplied and dehydrated, they start to ask, why are we here? What are we hoping to achieve? And to many of them, it seems, frankly, completely random that they've been sailed out to Egypt to do what? How exactly is this serving the motherland? How are they helping the revolution, helping France? You can see how many of them might feel like they're not really doing much out here, and maybe they should just head back to Europe, especially if it's going to be this difficult. Thanks so much to Trade Coffee for keeping us history-loving beans caffeinated. One week before, it's July 1st, and Napoleon's invasion of Egypt is so far a total success. He's <laughs> crossed the Mediterranean, eluded the British fleet, and taken Alexandria. On the way, he'd even forced the Knights of Malta to capitulate, plundering their treasure to fund mm -hmm. his campaign. But there is one little fly in the ointment, specifically a British fly by the name of Admiral Horatio Nelson. Yeah, this has honestly been the biggest danger that the French have faced. We talked about in that first episode, what were the risks that Napoleon was taking going on this expedition? And frankly, 
The Mamluks haven't been too much of a threat. The biggest threat they've faced is the British fleet. The biggest risk they've taken was sailing through the Mediterranean to get to Egypt. The French were very afraid of being caught by the British Navy, by Nelson in particular. They were very worried about what would happen. See, upon arriving in Alexandria, Napoleon found out exactly how close he'd been to getting caught by the British yeah. as a Royal Navy vessel had been in Alexandria only 24 hours before the French arrived. That meant that the British would... The French had basically just barely managed to skirt disaster on their way to Egypt. The question is, will they be able to continue to skirt disaster or will they have to face the British Navy? If they have to, uh, that might cause some serious problems. <laughs> Find them here soon enough. So he began drawing up his fleet to defend Alexandria against this inevitable naval attack, lest they be defeated at sea and stranded in Egypt. Then, with his naval situation definitely very secure, he prepared <laughs> Egypt for his rule. See, Napoleon knew that if he hoped to turn Egypt into a colony, he needed local support. That's why, when his men had looted the Vatican archives during the Italian campaign, they'd captured a very specific prize, the only Arabic language printing press in existence. Wow, so in existence? Wow. First off, that's a little tidbit that I did not know. I did not know how they had captured that printing press. Also, the only Arabic printing press in existence. That is fascinating. Now, this is sort of an element of Napoleon bringing those Enlightenment ideas to Egypt in particular, and I suppose to the Middle East more broadly. Now, you can be skeptical about that. You can certainly be skeptical about the sincerity of Napoleon and his men. Were they doing this for the right reasons? It's always a mix. But it is undeniable that Napoleon did bring, or at least he made more prominent, many of these Western Enlightenment ideas, some of these Western technologies in Egypt and in the region more broadly. And we can sort of see how that might have a sort of outsized impact, especially over the long term. Turning out propaganda leaflets in French, Arabic, Turkish, and Greek. People yes. of Egypt. Though, like I said last time, uh, a little tidbit is that at least initially, and this was actually mentioned in last time's video, Napoleon picked up Arabic translators from Malta. Now, these translators used a bit of a garbled Maltese version of Arabic, using a lot of loan words that was a little bit unintelligible to the natives of Egypt. <laughs> they sort of struggled to read Napoleon's proclamations a little bit. Begin one proclamation. You will be told by our enemies that I have come to destroy your religion. Though I'm sure he picked up better translators uh, shortly over time. Believe them not. Tell them that I am come to restore your rights, punish your usurpers, and raise the true worship of Muhammad. It was a pretty normal opening for one of these. And you know, to be honest, there are so many that we can't quote them all verbatim here. But here mm -hmm. are some of the big points that Napoleon reiterated. One, that the Mameluke sultans, a foreign minority, were the oppressors of Egypt. Two, that Napoleon had come to liberate the Egyptians mm -hmm. and restore their natural rights. Three, that he was a friend to Islam, having defeated both the Pope and the Knights of Malta. Yep. Four, that no Egyptian had any reason to fear, unless they resisted, in which case they would. Five, be mercilessly slaughtered. Yes, and it's really interesting to see how Napoleon approaches this campaign, and we can learn a lot from it. So, first off, this is absolutely true. Napoleon portrayed the Mamelukes as these foreign occupiers, these foreign oppressors, which, you know, they were. I mean, they'd been there for a long time, but technically true. He portrayed the Mamelukes as bad Muslims. They are these foreign occupiers who don't even truly uphold the Islamic faith. I, on the other hand, Napoleon, while I may not be Muslim, and he made sure not to clarify that, <laughs> what he would say is, I, Napoleon, am a friend of Islam. I'm a friend of the faith. I respect you. I respect your beliefs. I'm here to kick out these foreign oppressors and uphold your religion. That's sort of how he marketed himself. You can see how a lot of people might be skeptical hearing that coming from who they viewed as this sort of Christian European foreign occupier. Also, we see in those last two points something that Napoleon also emphasized in Italy. This was sort of Napoleon's policy. Basically, look, I'm going to be occupying your country. 
if you collaborate, if you cooperate, we're not going to have any problems. We will all be perfectly fine. I will bring to you the joys of the Enlightenment. But if you resist, I will crush you mercilessly. This is something that we've seen from Napoleon before. Like I said in Italy, he used this exact same policy. If you cooperate, all is well. If you resist, I will absolutely destroy you. And he's uh, bringing that philosophy here as well. <laughs> These proclamations were weird. On one hand, Napoleon had correctly identified the political and ethnic fault lines between native Egyptians mm -hmm. and the Mamelukes. The joint Mameluk rulers, Murad Bey and Ibrahim Bey, were deeply unpopular. And there was definitely room to pursue a divide and conquer strategy. But like I said, you know, he frames the Mamelukes as these foreign occupiers. And, you know, he is right. There is that divide between the Mameluk ruling class and the native Egyptians. The question is, can Napoleon portray himself as a better option? Can he portray himself as a true friend to the Egyptians, a true friend of Islam? Well, I guess we'll see. But his attempts to claim the secular deism of the French Revolution was compatible with Islam just because they were both strictly monotheist were unconvincing at best. Hmm. On top of that, these messages were also confusing. He used revolutionary buzzwords like liberty and natural rights that yep. are unfamiliar to most Egyptians and had no Arabic equivalent. And the translations yeah, he basically used a lot of loan words themselves were also just atrocious, largely yep. written by a French linguist with help from Maltese translators. There you go. Exactly what I said. Who spoke an unusual Arabic dialect. They contained basic grammatical errors. Yep, this is the point I was making. He used these Maltese Arabic translators who took a lot of loan words that, you know, the native Arabic speakers just didn't understand. With one message so garbled that it inadvertently claimed that the French were Muslims. With these messages, Napoleon aimed to get Egyptian religious leaders on his side thinking that they would be key to holding Egypt once he defeated the base. Yes, he absolutely aimed to get the Egyptians on his side and to get Egyptian religious leaders on his side. The issue that Napoleon will keep running into is that he will try to portray himself and the French as allies of Islam up until a certain point, basically up until the point where these imams, this uh, religious community, the religious leadership will ask Napoleon, okay, prove it. Convert. Become a Muslim. And Napoleon will, you know, waffle and go, well, I'm an ally to Islam, and eventually say no. Yeah, he decides not to convert. Also, he decides that, well, he can't really force all of his men to convert. That's not going to go down well. And so his words come off as a little bit unconvincing because he's not willing to go that next step. And he is still seen as a basically a Christian foreign occupier. I mean, this is the framework that a lot of Egyptians are looking at Napoleon from. Napoleon is coming with the Enlightenment and secular values, but you think of how these Egyptians are looking at him, you know, they might be thinking of the Crusades. They might be thinking of Christian Europe versus uh, Muslim Egypt. So it's just what he's saying is not meshing with what they're seeing and what these people believe. However, his clumsy proclamations were instead mocked by the very Islamic scholars he so hoped to impress. Yeah. Alexandrians, too. Napole there's several examples, stories about Napoleon coming to these religious scholars, coming to these imams with sort of basic knowledge of Islam, really base-level stuff, and expecting them to be super impressed with him. And they just weren't impressed. <laughs> they were like, okay... We see you've read up a little bit on Islam. That doesn't prove anything. And, I mean, they're right. It really doesn't. Seemed to be against him. After the army fanned out to find accommodations, several soldiers turned up with their throats slit. On the edge of town, Bedouins also kidnapped several officers and held them for ransom. And in response, Napoleon sent his Afro-Caribbean general, Thomas Alexandre Dumas, to handle the negotiations for their return. But they couldn't lose time. They really needed to press on. With the threat of the British fleet at their backs, they must secure their position and seize Cairo immediately. The plan was for a naval flotilla to enter the Nile, while Napoleon's army of the Orient marched inland across the desert before cutting east to seize river ports and meet the flotilla. Then all would move south along the river to Cairo. Good plan? Sure. Except, well, this was Egypt in mm -hmm. July. The French wore heavy wool uniforms, adorned with black leather and metal that heated quickly in the sun. 
They had no canteens or water wagons, and each carried a 40-pound pack plus a musket. And this is just a great example of Napoleon not being fully prepared or maybe even being a little naive. You know, you think his vision is clouded by the ideas of what he wants to do, his grand aspirations, but when it actually comes down to it, he's not quite ready for what needs to be done. He is not adequately prepared, which is going to lead to a lot of these issues. Not to mention cavalrymen often had to carry their saddles, since Napoleon had incorrectly assumed that he could just acquire hundreds of horses in Egypt. The and of course, this comes down to, in many ways, just the big difference in landscape, culture, etc., etc. Napoleon is in a very different place than he usually operates. Napoleon, you know, he's been campaigning in Italy, of course, he's from... Uh, well, he's from Corsica, but, you know, France, th this is where he spent a lot of time. He's familiar with Western Europe. This is very different. He just doesn't have the knowledge base, the practical knowledge, knowledge base that he needs. Of course, he's read up on the conquerors of old. He knows his classical history very well. But modern-day Egypt? Well, he doesn't know that nearly as well. And, sure, part of that is that that knowledge is pretty hard to come by. I mean, one of the impacts of this campaign from Napoleon is that he really studies Egypt and brings a lot of that knowledge back to Europe. So some of that knowledge is hard to acquire at the moment, but, you know, that's sort of something you have to deal with when you're planning such a large expedition. The initial march inland took three days. Men collapsed and died from dehydration. And when they came across village wells, they lost all discipline and scrambled for water until it was drunk dry. And dozens of men, desperate from thirst, took their own lives. A mm -hmm. dark joke circulated. Before attacking Alexandria, Napoleon had promised that each man would receive six acres of land after this campaign. Voila, they would say, gesturing at the barren desert, our six acres. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bedouin stalked the marching column, harrying and killing any stragglers. They even snatched soldiers and executed them within view of their comrades, just yep. out of musket range. I mean, it just... Imagine on a human level how absolutely horrific this must have been. You are marching through the desert, absolutely dehydrated, undersupplied, these thick woolen uniforms carrying your musket. If you're a cavalryman, you might be carrying your saddle in conditions so bad that some of your comrades have literally taken their own lives. Your men are being picked off by these Bedouins who are, of course, completely comfortable in these conditions. You would be, well, at times you might be despairing. You would be upset. You would also probably be angry. Angry at the situation. Angry at your officers. Angry at Napoleon. Because why are we here? This is a horrific situation. What are we doing here in Egypt? It's probably unclear to a lot of these soldiers why they even need to be here in the first place. Even after reaching the Nile, things definitely got no better. Upon reaching it, soldiers crowed in victory and threw themselves into the waters, splashing and drinking, until crocodiles ambushed oh, and dragged God. several into the river. Men who dumped rations to lighten their packs during the march died of exhaustion and hunger. A local disease broke out, blinding anyone infected. Most Egyptian villagers abandoned their homes ahead of the army, meaning they took all their food but the watermelons growing in their gardens, and if any remaining resisted them taking food, the French simply torched their village. Which yeah. one could imagine prompted what happened next. Surely, surely, though, imagine if you're one of those soldiers. At this point, you're feeling so desperate, you're basically fighting for your life. Their patience is down to zero. And all of that, you know, lofty ideology, all of, you know, we're going to treat the people of this region well. You know, we're coming as liberators. Well, that goes out of the window when you're hungry, dehydrated, and undersupplied. One day, a woman approached a French officer carrying a baby. But when she got close, she drew a pair of shears and gouged out his Ugh. eyes. It was then that Napoleon's generals began to whisper about the expedition. Yep. Several officers, gathering in General Dumas' tent to sample watermelon... Be Yummy, at least that's a watermelon. <laughs> And as I talked about earlier, this is what happens when you're in such a bad conditions and your officers start to think, why exactly are we here? And they get together and start talking about it. Stuff starts getting out of hand. Began to openly voice doubts about the mission. 
See, while these men had known that Napoleon was ambitious, they'd fought under him in Italy after all, they were now starting to realize a fundamental truth. Napoleon Bonaparte was willing to sacrifice anyone to take any number of casualties for his own advancement. And this is absolutely a fundamental truth of Napoleon, right? Uh, and this will be proven beyond doubt throughout the rest of his career. I mean, just look at the immense death toll of the Napoleonic Wars. Wars that really shaped Europe for all the years to come. People were horrified by the casualty count. Napoleon was willing to leave many dead behind him if he could achieve his own goals, if he could build his legacy, achieve political power. He could really be uncaring and brash in that manner. It was the attitude that would cause one of his commanders to later nickname him the 10,000 men a month general. The mm. army of the Orient had nearly had enough when they ran into the Mameluke forces coming. Now I will say a brief note on those meetings between Napoleon's officers because this will continue to be relevant up until a certain point. Of course, we don't know exactly what was said in those meetings. And so there was a lot of speculation about, well, what was said? Some people think that they were blatantly mutinous, but it seems more likely that they were just voicing their dissatisfaction. We don't necessarily have evidence that these officers were actually planning a mutiny or some sort of uprising. Uh, seems more like they were disappointed, dissatisfied, and wanted to voice those frustrations amongst each other. We'll talk more about this later, and like I said, it will remain relevant. The other way. The result was a confused battle on both land and river, with Napoleon forming the army into squares to resist the Mameluke cavalry charges. Meanwhile, the Mameluke flotilla boarded and captured three French ships before a lucky shot exploded the enemy flagship's magazine and caused them to retreat. But the armies would meet again. July 20th, yeah. 1798, near Cairo. They will call it the Battle of the Pyramids. They will call it the Battle of the Pyramids, even though the pyramids were a couple miles away from the actual battle. This is actually just another bit of Napoleon's fantastic propaganda. He felt that, you know, a battle with the background of the pyramids, you know, called the Battle of the Pyramids, was a lot more dramatic <laughs> than what actually happened. And so that is how Napoleon would market this battle, even though that's pretty untrue. And though in later paintings these structures will loom over the action, in reality they are nine miles distant. They are yeah. seen on the horizon. Yeah, exactly. Ottoman and Mameluke cavalry bear down on the French. Trained from childhood... The Battle of the Pyramids, it is a blatantly inaccurate name, but one that, like we said, Napoleon chose to conjure up a particular image in the mind of those readers back in France. You know, he wants them to think of the brave French soldiers fighting against these exotic and eastern Mamelukes with the pyramids as this dramatic and giant background. That is the image, the picture, that Napoleon is trying to paint. And a lot of it really does rely on this sort of um, exotic view that a lot of Europeans had of Egypt. This will be a big part of Napoleon's propaganda during this period and even afterwards. He really presents Egypt in this very particular, exotic, exciting way, which, well, it really excites a lot of French people and allows Napoleon to sort of sidestep some of the negative consequences of this campaign, as in the fact that it didn't necessarily go so well. Well, well Napoleon would say, don't look at that. Look at, you know, all this cool stuff we brought back. Look at all this fancy Egyptian stuff that you've never seen before. And, you know, the general public oohs and ahs. Once again, Napoleon and his propaganda, it's what he does. In martial arts and horsemanship, each one is a consummate warrior. Their gilded armor gleams and armed servants... We would call this Orientalism today, by the way. ...follow them to hand them appropriate weapons. The French are impressed, even awed by the sight. Still, they give no quarter. Fire! An officer yells, and cannons <laughs> blast out canister shot, throwing cones of lead balls into the horsemen. French infantry arranged into giant squares, so their bayonets make a hedge of blades, jet smoke with each volley. Now, the Mamelukes are proud warriors. They seized power from Saladin's dynasty and even defeated yeah. the Mongols, but they have never seen modern artillery or anti-cavalry tactics. 
Yeah, and, you know, this is the point I made last time especially. Regardless of the condition that the French army is in, and it's certainly not in its best shape (laughs) after marching through that desert, you know, they're fighting against these proud Mameluke warriors. They have a storied history. Uh, They are very skilled warriors. They just don't stand a chance with the modern tactics and modern technology of the French army. It's not a competition. The Mameluk horses scream and turn aside, terrified by the bursting artillery shells. Those that do reach the French wheel away, unable to find an opening to charge, and shying away from the wounding blades. I mean, the Mameluks are used to, you know, they have this storied warrior history. In recent years, most of the fighting the Mameluks have done has been amongst themselves. So you can imagine parties of these cavalrymen going up against other cavalrymen and these rather traditional cavalry battles. They have not faced a battle of this scale or against this advanced an enemy, and they're just not ready for it. Even firing into the French ranks does nothing, with wounded men pulled into the center of the squares and quickly replaced. Then, the horsemen try to rush between two squares to get behind, but it only puts them into a crossfire. Mm-hmm. 10,000 Mamelukes die by the River Nile, killing less than 300 French invaders for oh. days. Listen to that disparity, 10,000 to less than... 300, I believe it was. Let me hear that again. To get behind, but it only puts them into a crossfire. 10,000 Mamelukes die by the River Nile, killing less than 300 French invaders. Wow. For days, French soldiers will drag bodies out of the water to loot for coins and treasure. In one day of slaughter, Napoleon has gained Cairo. But can he hold it? Well, I've read these scripts for Ep3, and let me tell you, trouble <laughs> is really brewing. Napoleon's mm. situation is about to become a real grind as the French press on in their campaign. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, Zoe, how many more coffee puns do I have to do to make this yes. a smooth trip? All right, they're working into their ad. Once again, check out their video. It's linked down below. Check out their ad. Leave them a like. Give extra history support for making these fantastic videos. So, yes, we have this great French victory over the Mamelukes. 10,000 Mamelukes dead to less than 300 Frenchmen. Well, this campaign is going amazing. I mean, the French couldn't lose to the Mamelukes. How would this campaign go badly? Well, how could this campaign go badly? We've already seen marching through the desert ain't going so well. They've got the British on their heels. The British are waiting for an opportunity to strike at sea. There's a lot of other factors besides the Mamelukes. Uh, The fact that the native Egyptian population is skeptical of the French, and as time goes on, will become downright hostile. This whole thing is not going to go super well, and it's largely not due to the resistance of the Mamelukes. It's all these other factors that Napoleon has to deal with. Uh, Anyway, uh, another great episode of this series. I have very much been enjoying it. Uh, If you guys had a good time with this one, I would appreciate it if you would leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. And hey, if you hit that notification button next to the subscribe button, you will be notified whenever I release a new video. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.